This is 5 on 20 News, where the news is dark and depressing and this newscaster is sad and alone. It's 5 p.m. on Thursday, March 16th, and I'm coming to you live from the Creative Tucson studio in downtown Tucson. First, let's talk local headlines. A man broke into the Islamic Center of Tucson on Tuesday and destroyed multiple copies of the Quran. The ripped pieces were strewn around the building, according to authorities on the scene. The Islamic Center studied surveillance video and concluded in a Facebook post that the intent was to damage the center's religious property. They have footage of the man, but he has not been identified. Sergeant Kim Bay, a spokeswoman for the TPD, said that there is no indication that this was a hate crime, but didn't explain why, since the hate crime seems pretty hateful. The police said that they need to interview the suspect further to determine his motive. The Islamic Center said that they were disheartened by the destruction, but reminded the public that this was an isolated incident the Tucson community has largely been supportive of the center. And local care agencies are not happy with the recent Supreme Court decision to reject a challenge to the Proposition 206, which raised the minimum wage in Arizona. Gina Judy of the Easter Seals Foundation, which provides care to the elderly and handicapped, said that the organization is not able to charge the state higher, higher rates despite the wage raise. She said that foundations like hers are put at a financial disadvantage because of their relationship to state funding. In the challenge to the law, the Chamber of Commerce and others argued that the state would have to raise revenue to pay for these caregiver services. According to the Arizona Constitution, any new spending must be met with a way to pay for it without raising the deficit. So to account for this, caregiver organizations will not be able to raise the rates that they receive from the state and must absorb the cost themselves. The defense in the case, which included Attorney General Mark Brinovic, argued that the added costs were indirect and would not require new funding. While the argument is true, it didn't account for how organizations like Easter Seals would pay their workers the higher wage. Judy said that the vulnerable individuals would be the most hurt because they are provided critical health care and safety needs. She said that while she thinks the minimum wage increase is a good thing, she's not sure how the organization will handle the situation. There is already a shortage of health care workers and a high turnover rate in the industry, so it remains to be seen whether Easter Seals and others will have to make cuts. And after 35 years, Marina is cutting ties with the Pima Animal Care Center. The decision was made on Tuesday when the town council voted to end the relationship with the shelter. The Humane Society of Southern Arizona will take over the shelter animals and the town will also hire two new animal control officers. The town council Marina had complained of poor service among the agency as well as budget hikes. When the deal was first made 35 years ago, PACC's budget was 10,000. It is now more than $10 million per year, with Marana having to contribute about 230000 of that. Marana's town leaders put out an ad looking for a cheaper alternative and got one bid from the Humane Society. The new cost for Marana will be about 212000 per year, with 156000 in startup costs. And Arizona Senator John McCain yesterday accused Kentucky Senator Rand Paul of working for Vladimir Putin. McCain made the remarks after Paul v voted against allowing Montenegro to join the NATO coalition. McCain said that, quote, the senator from Kentucky is now working for Vladimir Putin, referring to Putin's comments that Montenegro joining NATO would threaten Russian sovereignty. Paul said that he voted against the inclusion of Montenegro because it would be more added cost to the U.S. NATO budget, which he says is already too high. U.S. officials, including Donald Trump, have complained that the U.S. has a higher financial burden than any other NATO member and that the coalition needs to change its system of funding. Regardless, McCain said of the vote that, quote, if there is objection, you are achieving the objectives of Vladimir Putin, and that a negative vote would be, quote, trying to dismember a small country that has already been the subject of an attempted coup. He was referring to the discovered plot by Russian and Serbian agents to assassinate Montenegro's president and install a government more hostile to NATO. McCain was also bothered that Paul only showed up briefly to deliver the vote and then left soon after. But to be fair, Rand Paul is busy trying to put out fires from the Trump care fiasco. University of Arizona researchers are studying a small Colombian town to find out the root causes of Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Edward Zamrini and Dr. Pierre Terrio work collaboratively under the Arizona Alzheimer's Consortium, a group of scientists who are researching and treating the particular form of dementia that typically affects older people. The two doctors were seeking out a group of individuals who are especially susceptible to Alzheimer's but were having problems. They then heard about a village located near Medellin in Colombia that had a history of people dying in their 30s, 40s, and 50s with Alzheimer's-like symptoms. They searched through church and hospital records in the area and were able to treat the people in the village to one Spanish immigrant from the 1600s. 
Because the Medellin area is isolated, the doctors assumed that people didn't move around much, so this would make the perfect natural lab conditions that they needed. 30 families in the area then agreed to participate in the study. The doctors were then able to secure funding to test out an experimental technique to thwart off early signs of dementia. While the experiment is still ongoing, the doctors say that they have the data ready to go in a year or two, when it will be publicly available because the study used government funding. They say that either way, their treatment won't help those with late stage Alzheimer's, but they w it will help the next generation to stop the disease. And I wanted to take a moment to talk about the program you're watching right now. Here at Five on 20, we are undertaking a new kind of citizen journalism. We're going to give you the news as we see it, and we want more people to speak up with us. We need writers, hosts, anchors, camera people, sound people, the whole gamut. The times require a new way of informing ourselves. So join us, do it, do it now. Email us at info at creativetucson.org to get involved. And if you think there's a story we're missing, a person we should interview, an upcoming event we should cover, or have any news tips for us, shoot an email to info at creativetucson.org. We're here for you and we wanna cover all stories from all points of views, so don't be strangers. And now in national and international news. A federal judge in Hawaii officially challenged the second attempt at a Muslim travel ban hours before it was ready to go into effect. Two other states, Maryland and Washington, were also hearing arguments against the ban when U.S. District Judge Derek K. Watson made the ruling to freeze the ban nationwide. The state of Hawaii brought the suit last week alleging that the ban targeted a religion and was therefore unconstitutional. Trump issued the second executive order for a ban after the first was rejected for the same reason. The second version left off Iraq from the list of six countries that would have travel restrictions imposed against them. Judge Watson said that the second ban was essentially the same as the first. In all three cases, the Justice Department argued that the president has the authority to protect national security in the U.S. and the ban would keep potential terrorists from entering the country. However, critics have pointed out that the countries where most of the terrorists have come from, such as Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, were not on the list of banned countries. In addition to the travel ban, a new order would have imposed a 120 ban on all refugees coming into the country. Trump said that this would give officials a chance to investigate the vetting process and offer suggestions to improve the system. When the ruling went down, Trump was still campaigning in Nashville in hopes that he would win that big election. He called the ruling, quote, judicial overreach and argued that the second ban was just a watered down version of the first, oddly echoing the plaintiff's case. But lest you think Trump learned his lesson, he doubled down and said that, quote, we ought to go back to the first one and go all the way. He really doesn't seem to have a handle on how this whole law thing works yet. It's not a stretch to say that the U.S. isn't very popular around the world these days. But our president is at least making some friends besides the Russians. Trump hosted Saudi Prince Mohammed bin Salman at the White House on Tuesday to repair relations between the two countries. Saudi officials dubbed the event a, quote, historic turning point because relations had been damaged under the Obama administration, who viewed the Saudis as an antagonist. The officials said the kingdom felt shunned under Obama when he made the 2015 nuclear deal with Iran, their Shiite rival in the Middle East. Throughout the campaign and into the presidency, Trump has criticized Iran and called the nuclear deal the worst deal in American history. Meanwhile, he's shown signs that'll cozy up to the Saudis who have been accused of ignoring an increase of radical Islamic groups in the country. They've also been accused of supporting terrorism worldwide and have been cited for world crimes as they battle the Houthis in the Yemeni civil war. In other words, a great ally to have. Trump offered his support to develop a U.S.-Saudi partnership that would develop energy, industry, infrastructure, and technology that would include $200 billion in direct investment over four years, according to a White House statement. Trump is also considering the decision to approve a Saudi arms deal to Bahrain the Obama administration had blocked. Amnesty International has urged Trump to not approve the deal because the weapons will be used in the Yemeni war and the organization has already found unexploded bombs around the country. They said that by approving the deal, the U.S. could implicate itself in war crimes that are occurring in Yemen. So far, nearly 4,000 civilians have been killed in the war in Yemen, most in airstrikes led by the Saudis and aided by the U.S. Meanwhile, the Trump administration announced a $50 million investment for the development of a special type of soap that will more easily wash the blood off their hands. And the Senate voted on Tuesday to repeal, repeal an Obama administration rule that banned unemployment recipients from having to take a drug tests. The Obama rule also limited the industries where drug testing could be used as a prerequisite for employment. It was voted down 51 to 48, completely on party lines. 
Trump is expected to sign the measure into law as drug testing people on unemployment has been one of those weird obsessions by the right. However, states that have implemented their own drug tests for welfare recipients, such as Florida, have proven to be largely ineffective. It's been shown that those receiving government help aren't any more likely to use drugs than the general population. The drug tests have also raised concerns about privacy rights and the expense to operate such tests. The Senate's vote was opposed by civil rights groups such as the ALCA and the ALFCIO, the nation's largest union organization. However, the fake urine industry cheered the bill. HIV sufferers in Tanzania are in a state of fear because of the recent laws cracking down on homosexuality in the country led by Islamic leadership. Last August, the Tanzanian justice minister suspended HIV prevention programs in the country funded by the U.S. He warned that any nonprofits that support homosexuality would be suspended. Since then, several nonprofits have been shut down for helping homosexuals in the country. In February, the government banned 40 private drop-in health centers that provided help to, quote, key populations that include gay men, transgender people, and sex workers. Health Minister Ami Mawami said that the groups were promoting homosexuality, which is against Tanzania's laws. In March, the country's health minister commended the police for cracking down on acts of homosexuality and ordered three men to turn themselves in for spreading homosexuality. Tanzania has a history of anti-gay legislation, including a 30-year jail sentence for male sex. Lesbian sex, oddly enough, is not illegal in the country. Tanzania receives about $380 million per year from PEPFAR, the U.S. program that supports programs to prevent HIV and AIDS and provides medication for those that are HIV positive. Nila Goshal of Human Rights Watch said that whenever d countries deny funding for HIV prevention, there then will be a sharp increase in the cases of HIV. Despite the laws, Tanzania has been known for its community support for the LGBT community until John Ma Magufuli was elected president in 2015. Magufuli, nicknamed the bulldozer, stepped up efforts to penalize homosexuality and those that support them. He also targeted journalists for good measure. When Magufuli's term ends in 2018, Republicans in Congress are looking to recruit the bulldozer because, according to GOP rep Todd Aiken, the dozer is our kind of guy. Anti-Islamic candidate Geert Wilders lost the Dutch election to Mart Rudy. Bullying, uh, dealing a blow to the right-wing wave sweeping across the world, at least temporarily. Rudy is a center-right candidate whose VVD party also won the majority in the Dutch parliament. Wilders has become somewhat of a worldwide sensation due to his harsh views towards refugees and Muslim integration into Dutch society. However, some experts say that Wilders accomplished his goal of changing the conversation within Dutch society. Andre Crowell, a political so society at Amsterdam's Free University, claims that Wilders probably didn't want to enter government anyway, but achieved what he wanted in shaping the national discussion in the Netherlands. So while the racist train might have been slowed down a bit, it's still spewing garbage out the side and certainly hasn't stopped. Next up is the French election, where the female Trump, Marine Le Pen, is expected to make the second round runoff in May's presidential election. Also in Germany, the anti-Muslim alternative for Deutschland, or AFD, party is gaining steam and could win the first parliament seats. Overall, the attitude in the Netherlands seems to be positive after Wilders lost, as the election had a high turnout of over 80%, and papers declared that they woke up to a, quote, normal Dutch society. But still, no one has mentioned the fact that Gilt Wilders is clearly Jimmy Page going by a fake name, probably to avoid taxes. This was Ani East Quintella for 5 on 20 News. Next up, watch Ty Best harass some middle school children from Apollo Middle School.